Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to give people a couple moments to enter the room and be able to see and hear us clearly. Good morning. If everyone can take a moment to go ahead and introduce themselves in the chat box and just share where you're joining us from. And make sure just as a, I know a number of you have been at our other sessions, but if you can ensure that in your two section that you're addressing all panelists and attendees, then both us and um, your peers can see them. Pennsylvania, Hagerstown. CCBC, West Virginia again. Hi guys. I feel like you guys answer back to back every morning. West Virginian, my fellow West Virginians. Green Rock. Eastern Shore, awesome. Awesome, this is really great. So I'm really, really excited that Tom had initially submitted a proposal for this session because there's so much power in peer sharing. So um, Tom and Shaketa are specifically from the Virginia Department of Corrections, which you can see. But I just, I'm, I'm really excited to have this session today because it's our first opportunity to share uh, best practices in correctional, or serving our correctional students. Um, so that's just really wonderful. So before we get started, and I know I, um, I have done this in our other sessions, if you can go ahead and take the poll. I know in some of our programs, rather than instructor, you say teacher. Um, so if you can fill out what best fits your role within your program, that'd be awesome. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys for taking a moment to do that for me. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and just share so you can see who's present with us today. So we have a number of ABE instructors, which is wonderful because I think they have some really great tips on how to continue serving your students, regardless of maybe not being able to physically be with your students. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Tom and Shaketa, allow them to introduce themselves, and I hope everyone enjoys. Uh, thank you, Gina. Really appreciate the the introduction and good morning and welcome to all those of you who are joining us from uh, across the country. I hope you are able to find this presentation uh, informational and enjoyable. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Thomas Connolly, and alongside me is Ms. Shaketa Thomas. Today, we're going to be talking with you regarding how we in the Virginia Department of Corrections try to ensure the continuity of instruction during the COVID-19 lockdown. What started as maybe we'll be off of school for two weeks has now continued into six, seven, eight months. Um, but we still have students that need instruction. So how we are attempting to ensure the continuity of instruction. A little bit about myself before joining the Department of Corrections. I worked in public K-12 education for 15 years as a teacher, an assessment specialist, and as an assistant principal. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Thomas, Ms. Shaketa Thomas, to introduce herself. Good morning. My name is Shaketa Thomas, and I am the School Assessment Coordinator for the Department of Corrections. Um, I have worked in adult education for over 20 years, 15 years um, in correctional education, um, which is my passion. I have a keen interest um, for adult learners that are um, in our correctional systems and making sure that they are able to develop and grow so that they can be productive citizens upon re-entering society. I am also on the Virginia Adult Association of, of, of Continuing Education, stumbling over my words there, um, board where I serve as the secretary. And I'm also a member of COAVE and the Region 2 representative for COAVE. Okay, hey, uh, thank you, Ms. Thomas. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, Ms. Davis has already asked you to introduce yourself in the chat, I believe everyone is muted, but during the presentation, if you just wouldn't mind keeping your microphone muted to keep down the keep down the feedback. If you have any questions or comments, please use the Q&A and chat feature as those are going to be monitored 
throughout the presentation. Ms. Thomas and I will do our best to address those questions as, as they arrive. Um, also, at the end of the presentation, our contact information will be shared. So if there's any further information, documents that we spoke about that you would like to uh, see or have access to, please reach out to us and we'll do our best we can to make that happen. Ms. Thomas? All right, so who are we? The Virginia Department of Corrections, Correctional Education. And I'm just gonna give you um, um, throughout this presentation a, a overview, an operational overview. As you know, we are a fairly large um, correctional entity body here in the state of Virginia with over 43 institutions across the Commonwealth. Now it is the mission of the DOC to enhance the quality of life in the Commonwealth by improving public safety. And there are a number of ways that the agency seek to accomplish this goal throughout its varying departments. However, here for the Correctional Education Unit, we work towards this overarching goal by providing evidence-based instruction, programs, and strategies which foster positive change. Our motto is Virginia Department of Corrections, Correctional Education, paving the way through re-entry. So a little bit about our organizational structure. Um, uh, director is Harold Clark and um, correctional education is under the programs education and reentry, which is um, led by Scott Richardson and we have our own superintendent, Dr. Barry. And for academics is what Tom and I, we are fall under our academic programs that is led by um, Dr. Olga Lopez. Now we do have, like I said, work centers across community um, CCAP programs um, for the nonviolent crimes and those who are really focusing on transitional services. So with 43 institutions, we're kind of divided up by regions um, and those regions are served by regional school administrators. And each one of the facilities have their own principals, um, their teachers, whether it's academic programs, CTE programs. So we do have a lot of institutions and they're fairly large, a, a couple of them, um, like our Sussex One State Prison or our Greensville, which is a massive institution, three in one. Um, we have a lot of different programs that go on with inside of each one of them. And a lot of things to keep in mind um, when we're trying to figure out how can we continue service during this pandemic. So um, as I said, throughout our schools, we offer our CTE. We offer things that we try to um, survey the job market and see exactly where we are um, when we're developing programs and offering students new programs. And our academic programs, we do do adult basic education. We do also do um, ESL as well as our Plaza Communitarias, um, which is there for students who have a detainer and will be returning to either Mexico or some of our Latin American countries. And it's equivalent to a high school diploma. Um, we're really excited to have that unique program, which we offer in conjunction, in conjunction with the Mexican consulate. Um, now, the way we're kind of set up is that for ABE, we have four 90 minute um, classes throughout the day. Um, the classes are two to three hour class periods per day. And we usually meet at most of our facilities Monday through Thursdays um, with a lot of the schools being closed on Fridays. Uh, students who do not have a high school diploma or a high school equivalency once they come inside of our correctional institution, it is compulsory that they attend academic programs in order to make um, skill gains and hopefully achieve their GED. And that is in accordance to our state law. So we do make sure that we um, place all of our students on a waiting list. However, with only 43 institutions, and, and you've probably seen this in, in research papers and across the news, uh, for those who are invested into correctional education, um, a lot of our students, unfortunately, are not able to be served during their time of incarceration due to the limited capacity that we have at our schools. For instance, um, our institutions host, um, house rather, anywhere between 900 to 1200 inmates. Um, but at best, at most of our facilities, we can probably enroll anywhere between 180 to 240. Um, so we typically have three to four educators for academic programs per school with a maximum enrollment of 15 students, depending upon the security level of that school. Um, so expanding that capacity um, and reaching all those that we can serve has really been a concern and, and it's really heightened that awareness here during the pandemic. And I'll let Tom tell you more about um, how we have dealt with the pandemic in his timeline. Tom? 
Yeah, sure. And, and Ms. Thomas, real quick, there was a question um, from the introduction, and I answered it in the chat, but just to make sure, can you tell us what uh, COAVE, what the acronym COAVE stands for? Um, so for COAVE, it is the Commission of Adult Basic Education, and it is a, a one of the largest national adult education associations, and you can find them at COAVE.org. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Um, so as Ms. Thomas shared with you, uh, our operational and, and the, the programs we offer and the students we serve, just to take you back to a quick timeline of what has happened in Department of Corrections over the last eight months as we tried to ensure our students were able to receive educational services. Um, if, for those of you who don't know, uh, Governor Ralph Northam is the governor of Virginia and back in March uh, using, I believe it's called public Health Emergency Order Number One, Governor Northam closed all non-essential gatherings, including schools. In that affected Department of Corrections schools as well as it tried to stem the tide of the COVID-19 virus spreading throughout our facilities. That happened very suddenly, and we were kind of left scrambling as to what to do. So in April, the Department of Corrections began to reallocate some of our educational personnel within the facilities to meet the other needs of the agencies. Those uh, things like taking temperatures of inmates, of officers coming to work, and of any guests coming into the facility. In May, we began some educational projects, such as our reinventing our personal learning plan. And we also saw, saw a time, if you remember back to May and June, national civil unrest. And we mentioned this because that actually came into play in some of our decisions we had to make later as we tried to ensure the continuity of education. In June and August, we had our first discussions on what we were going to do and how we were going to reopen schools. We had working dialogues with our principals and our teachers on what their needs were and how we could continue to best serve them and our students. Those June-August discussions were really targeted for a September to October reopening. Um, however, with the recent surges, that has, that has been delayed. We also, starting in September, began work on a new Department of Corrections GED and ABE curriculum and began to target specific facilities for a piloted reopening plan. The DOC originally had planned to reopen schools in October, However, now we are in a position where those restarts have been delayed due to the rising cases in Virginia specifically, but also nationally of COVID-19. So that's where we sit currently. Just a few questions for you, if you wouldn't mind answering these in the chat box. There's three questions on the board. The first question is, what impact did COVID-19 have on your local program or facility? What, were you, what was your organization's response to the initial COVID-19 crisis? And what were the challenges that you faced or your organization faced um, because of the shutdown and because of the COVID-19 pandemic? So take just a couple minutes if you can answer those questions in the chat, we'll review those. Thank you. So Tom, while people are answering that question, you had a question. Um, I miss what the program and credential was called for the Latino students who will be returning to other countries like Mexico and South. What was it called? If you can repeat it. Sure, one. that is, go ahead, Chiquetta. It is called the Plazas Comunitarias. And I will go ahead and type that in the chat. And it is a program through the um, Mexican consulate Awesome, thank you so much. So there's uh, some folks here said they were open, they were closed from March to August and then open and now they've been closed down again, uh, sending packets weekly to, to students. Uh, some programs have been shut down. It's definitely challenging to find a way to continue offering instruction. School's been closed since March a lot of sending packets and looking at the attendance list, I believe we have some of our uh, colleagues here, Shiketa, so that's probably right on board with what we've been doing as well. Uh, learning technology without internet facilities has definitely been a challenge and uh, these are coming fast and furious. So if I don't read yours, I apologize. A lot of instructional packet. Um, 
some one teacher said very much like Virginia's response. I went back for seven weeks, but now they're shut down again. Now working from home and sending instructional packets. So, Tom, I'm also looking um, at, at a lot of these chats, and there's a lot of opening and shutting down and reopening and shutting down and the back and forth. And, you know, I'm just throwing this out there, um, and it, it really isn't a part of our presentation, but I start to wonder the back and forth and, and the impact um, that it may be having on our students, the, the gravity there within of going back and forth and, and, and the certainty of it all. And I know we're all impacted in different ways, but I, I just kind of wonder as I see this, this is something um, that is happening uh, across the nation. A lot of start, restart, and then automatic shutdowns and, and how our students are able to progress and some of those assessment issues that, that we are dealing with of how do we account for measurable skills gain. So those are just some of the things that I'm looking at as I'm, I'm looking into the chat. So I apologize for going off in a tandem, but I find it very relevant um, to our conversation, especially when we're looking at how do we progress students along the way. And we hope to give you a, a few ideas um, in this presentation, but I am interested to hear from a lot of you as well about um, how things are working and what are some of the things that you're doing to, to overcome the challenges that are before us. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful point, Chiquetta. I know you guys are gonna talk in a little bit about your retention strategies, but I'm sure whether you're in correctional education or in a detention center or whatever your approach is to adult education, that's definitely impacting it for sure. And now uh, what I wanna to bring to, to our attention is one person said, look, it looks like, uh, sorry, Laura, um, Laura Askin said that they actually are doing remote learning via Zoom and book work, uh, I believe in a county jail, if I'm reading that correctly. And that is great because one of the challenges we're gonna talk about here is the lack of technology and the lack of ability to do remote instruction via things like Zoom, Google Meets, things like that, because we uh, do not have internet in any of our facilities for really any any classroom instruction. So that's definitely a challenge. So looking at this, it sounds like a lot of us were faced with the same challenges. We were immediately shut down. We had to reset, reimagine, and do things that might take us two or three months in the course of two or three weeks. And how do we best send um, instruction to students in the in the face of immense challenges, the likes that we've never seen before. Um, and one of the ways we started is by looking back at our mission statement of fostering a healing environment. And Ms. Thomas is going to talk to us a little bit about that as well. Yes. Yeah, so that, that was a part of the question that I was asking about the restarts and the shutting downs automatically, because one of the things that the Department of Corrections are, are um, of our business practice, our motto is to foster a healing environment, um, which is to increase the public's confidence and public safety, but also we're in the business of helping people um, do better. And that's what our director set forth for all of us to do. And when we talk about helping people do better, we're not just talking about the inmates, but we're talking about the staff and all those who come in contact with the Virginia Department of Corrections. So under this model, we have incorporated daily practices um, that the agency uses to foster a healing environment. However, with this in pandemic, to be able to actually do that with some type of fidelity uh, was a little bit disrupted. We were just not prepared, <laughs> many of us, a lot of us, probably all of us, for the enormity um, that this pandemic has brought about. Um, so we were challenged with having enough resources and access to offer remote instruction. Um, how do we provide ongoing services? We began by providing our students with instructional packets, but being that we were um, close to the end of our budget year, back when all of this kicked off, we find ourselves scrambling for little things like paper to be able to print out all those instructional packets. Some of our schools had just simply ran out of paper. So what we were gonna do about that to make sure we had um, equity and access to that um, then we had to think about our students and, and the loss of motivation that they were experiencing. And I, I know that's an up and down thing as we keep 
um, seeing surges and resurgence with numbers, um, our students lose confidence. They lose that motivation um, to continue to work on, on their studies and to increase their skills. So like all of us, their normal routine have been disrupted, um, but it was even more so for them because even now, you know, as we see um, the cases and the hospital overloads for, for the inmates, they're unable to really connect with their loved ones and to be there with their loved ones. And then they're not able to come to school. They're not able to move forward and progress. And they're just sitting around just wondering how everything will eventually impact them, especially when cases hit their facility, anxiety kind of goes up. So we had to think about ways to encourage them to continue on with their studies, to continue to do their instructional packets and how we can have graduation ceremonies for those who did complete um, to be able to celebrate gains along the way. And I, I would like to note that even though we've been strained, we haven't been able to do as much testing, um, GED testing as we have in the previous years, we've had had students to complete, um, receive their GED, and we've had had some small but restricted graduation ceremonies. Maybe families weren't able to come there, but we were able to do that. And, and that has been a big concern, testing. Um, and, and as a lot of you are out there now and we're looking at the NRS comments um, and really looking at assessments and, and that base, that has really hit home for us too. Um, since students have not been able to leave their buildings and come over to the school um, where we are able to conduct a testing, we found ourselves no longer being able to provide um, the TAVE test in order to measure growth and continuous needs. And that's the assessment that we generally use. So we had to be creative and, and we're developing and administering alternative tests to kind of see where students are. So we know what to include in their packets, how that we can and help them. And, you know, giving out assessments to the pods or for the inmates to complete on their own uh, without any type of supervision or overseeing, we had to lend that trust. We had to send out honesty statements saying that, you know, we agree that we will do this on our own merit. And, and we just had to allow that to be and let down our guard some. We're not sending out secure test materials. There are our own assessments that we have developed, but they are helping us to be able to see where students are and how we can progress them along. And then with extreme precaution, we have provided the GED tests um, a couple of times to individuals um, on an individual case by case basis from the start of the pandemic. Uh, we allow testing in cohorts no more than five individuals at a time. We make sure that they all reside in the same building and the same pod so that we don't have any cross contamination. Um, and then we make sure that we um, sterilize and do everything else to make sure everyone is safe. And then the other challenge is um, ADA and students with disabilities. We really had to make sure um, that we continue to service this stu these students because of it's a federal law. So we make sure that we identify those students who are exceptional or special ed or even those who have a disability. And we have provided students um, testing, students with disabilities testing um, throughout this pandemic to make sure that we're meeting the mandates there. So that has been a challenge, but it's a challenge that we have stepped up to. We have done um, continuous communications with everyone involved to make sure that all of our students receive the services and accommodations um, they are afforded to receive. And you got a, somebody drop drop a note in the chat here that I, I just want to make make uh, make make note of a lot of the challenges we're talking about right now are operational challenges we have not even dipped our toe into the water of the what the students have been going through and I think this quote really captures it uh, my student and it's from uh, oh god so I'm going to butcher this name but I apologize Pert Toins Banks uh, it says my students face the fear of the virus and suffer through feelings of abandonment by me as well as their families, suddenly we were all gone and their foundations were no longer secure. So a lot of the challenges we are talking about are operational. And I really appreciate you bringing up that point because we, like I said, have not even begun to address yet how those students are feeling. And as we reopen, that it's definitely going to be a challenge that we are gonna have to face head on if we want to um, you know, put success in the hands of our students. Um, and with all those challenges in mind, and my PowerPoint's running a little slow here, so there, you should be able to see the next slide. With all those challenges to education in mind, 
just a reminder that the, the Department of Corrections was most concerned with the health, safety, and security of all the individuals in our facilities, um, including the officers and civilian staff working there. And in order to meet the expectations of safety and security in the mounting face of staff absences due to the COVID-19 pandemic, educational staff had to be deployed to other assignments. Teachers, principals, administrative staff, even our superintendent of education were deployed to various facilities around the Commonwealth to do things like take temperatures of guests, inmates, and officers, prepare meals, clean the pods in the day rooms, or meet what other, whatever other need of the agency to meet that goal of safety, health, and security within the, within the facilities. Now, as um, headquarters educators, we knew that we needed to step in and support each other and our students to make sure that they were receiving the best educational experience that they, that they possibly could. Uh, Shaketa touched a little bit about the, the working dialogues earlier, and she's going to talk a little bit about um, more of that, a little bit more about that now. Okay, I see a question just popped up in the chat, and it says, um, by reassignment of correctional staff, do you mean educational staff employed by the DOC? And, and yes, we do. Um, so our, our teachers, our administrators, um, they were deployed, and, and even some of us that do not work in the institution daily were sent out to cover institution shortage and gaps to make sure um, that the security and safety of the institutions, as that is the primary concern, are carried out daily. So yes, we do mean our educators. And you know, as we talk about that, and we uh, said before, one of our missions and our goals as the Department of Corrections is to foster a healing environment. And the way that we do that is through communicating and dialogue um, together is our, our method of thinking and learning. So with that in mind, we began to host working dialogues weekly um, with our teachers and our administrators as a vehicle to engage in generative dialogues to find answers to our challenges. So the goal of these weekly meetings was to listen to the needs, the feelings, and thoughts of our teachers and administrators in order to advance ourselves, ourselves collectively and individually to tackle our barriers brought about by this pandemic. So in March, we began holding these meetings. And at first, we only invited the administrators. And initially, we started with just listening to the challenging challenges that they were facing at their respective facilities. Um, as we just discussed, staff was being reallocated. Um, then we had staff who had those underlying conditions, um, staff who were of that concerned age population, um, who were just, you know, not just fearful, but being cautious about catching a virus or, or having something detrimental um, happen to their health. And then we had some that were teleworking and, and some of our staff simply retired. So we also heard their frustrations, our administrators' frustrations, as they were tending to their personal lives as well. Um, because many of us, we have spouses, we have children, as you may hear some in my background, as we're all doing homeschool and people are moving around. Um, and some of our, our staff had el elderly parents and, and, and people that they needed to tend to. Um, so we held these discussions for the first few weeks. And then we moved into deeper conversations and more skillful conversations where we began to dialogue about the needs of our students and the importance of keeping our identity, our identity as correctional educators. Um, and, and this was a big, big point that they brought about. I mean, no one minds helping around the institution. No one minds being able to fill in those gaps and to service um, outside of education, but at the end of the day, we still wanted to be able to provide educational services to our students. So our identity was a big concern. At this point, we know we needed to include the teachers and we needed to hear their voices um, as equally in discovering how to best address the challenges we face. So then from there, topics, topics begin to emerge from curriculum development, the evaluative process, teacher training needs, 
and student engagement. And we continued our skillful conversations and we found ourselves engaging more into generative dialogue where we were able to combine our knowledge and our abilities to create workable solutions to overcome our challenges. Um, and then we started sharing resources such as Newzella and um, the PBS learning website. Uh, we began to really push that out and our teachers and some of our other staff really began to grab hold of that. And as well as for reallocating, we had to also reallocate our testers um, in order to help with to being able to provide that continuity of educational services since our teachers were being used otherwise. Um, so they began using these resources and helping with the development of the instructional packets. Tom? Yeah, and speaking of the, uh, the reallocation of the testers, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because one thing we had to do before reallocating those testers was contact GEDTS to make sure that our testers could be involved in the development of instructional material. Because as you may or may not know, uh, basically you cannot test and instruct the same material at the same time. So once we got the clearance from GEDTS that this was okay, we really appreciated that because it really would have put us in the bind without it. We started to develop these instructional packets, like Ms. Thomas said, using websites, starting with the PBS Learning website and Newzella, and then really getting into developing um, our own instructional packets. And if you would like a, a copy of uh, what one of these instructional packets looks like, please reach out to us after the presentation and we can, we can get you that. And the packets included uh, materials grouped by ABE level. There were questions, answer keys, documents specifically meant for students to ask questions to send to their teachers and for their teachers to provide feedback by their students. And I think I said this, that they were grouped by ABE level. Uh, developing those packets in and of itself was not without its challenges. Uh, first, as we mentioned, May and June saw several incidents nationwide that resulted in civil unrest. And while we wanted to make sure, because we are dealing with adults, that the material was relevant, we had to be mindful of anything that we sent to the students. We did not want to spark any undue controversy within the facilities due to some instructional material that we had sent in. Secondly, remembering back to April and May, folks were still not 100% sure of how COVID-19 was spreading on surfaces at that time. And the data specifically of transmission via paper was very limited. So some facilities were requiring that packets be quarantined for up to 72 hours before being distributed, and then another 72 hours after they were sent back to the teachers. As Shiketa mentioned, uh, they required a lot more paper than we had budgeted for, and we were quickly approaching the end of our fiscal year. Luckily, our facilities were able to get together and pull some resources and redistribute that. But that was a problem we had just not foreseen. When you're developing educational materials, one of the problems that just did not cross our mind was, I hope we have enough paper to make this happen. The development of packets, um, had, had slowed for a little bit, but now is picking back up again. Like I said, we were planning on reopening back in October, and now that that's not happening, our testing, our tester team or our instructional packet team is starting to meet again to continue to develop instructional packets. But again, we are facing some of those same challenges of when you send those into the pods, are they getting done? Are they getting done individually? And those are challenges that we are trying to overcome. But sometimes, you know, we, our goal here is to make sure that our students are in getting instructional material and that they have something to do. And we're trying to provide culturally relevant, culturally relevant and up-to-date resources on current events while maintaining civility within the facilities, which sometimes is a very tight rope to walk. Uh, Ms. Thomas? And we have seen that the, the rate of the packets being returned kind of fluctuates. Um, and, and, and that goes back to how do we keep our students engaged and motivated? So I don't want to give the false illusion that our students are like on board 100% all the time. Um, you know, this is real life with real problems. And so um, 
you know, we have to expect and, and have to think about ways of how do we develop that understanding? How do we continuously uh, motivate? But um, as, as Einstein uh, once says, you know, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. And, and that has really been our focus here. You know, while we're our backs up against the wall, or we're faced with so many challenges um, that we've never seen in our lifetime and in, in, in this era in our parents' lifetime, what are the opportunities that lie within? What can we really do? And we started with the instructional packets, but then where can we go from there? Um, and I'm not sure if there, I've seen some things coming up in the chat and I just wanna make sure that I address those. So Tom, is there anything you've seen in the chat as far as a question? No, I think just some, just some comments um, okay. about what other folks are doing. Uh, I saw one said that the jail actually has Google Meet, so they're able to deliver remote instruction, which is awesome. Um, but just some comments that are coming up about the packets and, and important points regarding um, sending sensitive material inside, inside facilities. Okay, great. I just want to make sure I didn't miss any questions along the way. And we do hope to have some time um, at the end for a few more conversation. But go ahead, Tom. Yep. And uh, so that's a great point about how we're, we're looking for opportunities to do things better than we had done them in the past. So once we established our immediate response, we were continuing to look for ways to continue to reach our students through more engaging means. Now, luckily, the Department of Corrections, there are several other units that were looking to do the same thing. One in particular was our mental health services unit. And they had a great idea that they were going to create a remote video channel that could be looped on the closed circuit televisions within the pods and day rooms. And we created, and I was lucky enough to be part of that project, and we created DVDs that supported everything from mindfulness and hygiene to uh, yoga and math. So it was very wide reaching. Educationally, we were lucky enough to be able to tap into the teachers within our agency, some of which are extremely technologically savvy that were able to create some dynamic video lessons. And some of those educators might be on this call right now. And we could not have done that without tapping into those resources. So if you're here and you're listening, thank you very much. Um, some of those lessons were based on the instructional packets. Others were just meant to be mentally stimulating and engaging. Some were instructional videos that were borrowed for some of our more high security facilities that had been doing distance education as part of their normal operations for quite some time. Uh, some of our more high achieving students were asked to provide videos. We have one uh, student that has an associate's degree who's also fluent in Spanish who created two one hour Spanish lessons. One student created a video on cooking meals, uh, another on plumbing fittings. And even one, uh, like I said, made a three-part series on conversational Spanish. They were sent to our Academy on Staff Development, who's kind of like our in-home video production team. And we were able to create five one-hour DVDs to send out to the facilities. The project went on hiatus for a little while, but we actually just got word about two weeks ago that they're going to restart it again. And we're hoping to have another one hour DVD sent uh, in the near future. Ms. Thomas. So, yes, that oh, was a I'm good sorry. way to get some of our students involved and keep them motivated and actually being able to um, see a peer on the screen before them as we're not able to have internet resources, but to see them on their television screens and everything else, um, it kind of builds momentum and excitement. So we're happy that we're gonna be restarting this program really soon. And another thing that we came up with during our weekly meetings was looking at our personal learning plan. Being such a large agency with multiple sites, as I discussed earlier, it is not inconceivable that we had some inconsistencies among our schools with regards to the personal learning plan. From school to school, teacher to teacher, this tool was being identified in varying ways. Some call it the learning plan, individual learning plan or educational plan. And there were different forms being utilized, which can be confusing for the students that we serve who are very transient with inside of our own system. So they move from place to place. And we wanted to establish a, a uniform document that no matter where they were located, they would be able to have something, a tool that they could recognize. Um, 
So as I, when we started having these working dialogues and we started having these meetings, um, the PLP was identified as a goal with immediate urgency that we can utilize to, to heighten the strengths of our entire correctional education academic arm um, and to develop a comprehensible universal document. And since our programs and the materials we use are evidence-based, we went ahead and we researched um, what an effective PLP may look at like so that we can um, kind of frame our work um, uh, beyond um, in something that is actually utilized inside the classroom. And what we turn to is the father of adult education, no other than Malcolm Knows. And he stated that adults learn best under the following circumstances. The learner has to be self-directed, the learner is experienced as experiential and utilizes background knowledge. Learning is relevant to current roles. Um, destruction is problem centered and students are motivated to learn. So by incorporating these five principles of andragogy into instruction, adult educators and learners alike will experience greater success in the classroom. And from this, we kind of took away what it is that we needed to utilize to drive our skills in order to develop this new PLP. Um, so we incorporated all those elements. And what's imperative to note, once again, that this document is student-centered and it is a living document. So we really do sit down with our students and we really do ask for their input. We really do wanna know what their goals and, and what their strengths and their weaknesses are from their own perspective. And not just the teacher um, telling students what they need to work on and telling students um, how they can get to wherever they need to be. Um, so while the teacher does assist the student in developing small attainable goals within a reasonable time frame. It is just absolutely necessary, we felt, that the student determine what outcomes they wish to achieve and where they would like to start. Because again, we're looking at ways to increase student engagement. And the only way that we can do that is to build up that intrinsic motivation and allow them to have a voice in this entire process, whether we're in a pandemic or not. And as somebody says, students really did feel abandoned. So giving them an opportunity, whether we're doing it through instructional packets and mailing out um, these forms and allowing them to just be able to communicate and hear from us really does do wonders. Tom? Yeah, and um, Shaketa, real, real quick, uh, we did have a question. Um, if you wouldn't mind addressing us in Maryland, we are, provide, we are required to provide library services. How did we provide library services to the students? So it, it did happen differently from institution to institution, but we do have our library coordinator who, um, who utilized the guidelines issued by the CDC of how we can issue books um, from student to student, return them, make sure that they sat out for um, a number of days before that that book could be placed back into circulation again. Um, now, this was also contingent upon how the cases were at the facilities um, and, and, and the ability for staff to be able to actually do that work if they weren't called to be able to serve in another critical area. So this did just happen. It did happen, but it wasn't consistent from institution to institution. But we did also try to make sure that each pod um, have books within that pod that students could kind of check out and use as well. So that's how we handled that. Uh, thank you. And yeah, looking again, uh, more at our extended response, we'd mentioned before that we revamped our curriculum or really created our own DOC, GED and TAPE curriculum. Uh, so we did that in addition to building our person, personal learning plan. And as looking at that, we found that our current curriculum was really inadequate to meet the needs of our students. So we looked at the CCRS, TAPE, CASAS and GED standards in all four content areas, as well as basic technology competencies to make sure that our students had a clear path to success. After all, I'm sorry, academic staff were involved in the weekly dialogues to construct the curriculum framework document, and it's still in draft form, but should be ready for publication at the, at the end of the year. Another um, project we've taken on is something called the New Start Academy or ANSA. It, it's a new venture. The program was established for students who, who were released during the pandemic and were very close, maybe a test or two away from, from completing their GED. 
And many of these individuals are currently involved in our probation and parole or P&P programs. Uh, many of these students had challenges when they returned home. I mean, as you can imagine, returning home in the midst of a global wide pandemic, as well as being on probation and parole presents many challenges, but we wanted to make sure that these students could continue on with their educational journey. We reached out to Essential Education and we asked if we could convert some of the seats that we're utilizing in our classrooms to online accounts for these individuals. And thankfully, working with Essential Education, they said yes. And today we've had two probation and parole students who have earned their GED through the ANSA program. Um, however, our new students will enroll to the GED Academy program. Um, so we are able to offer remote options to students who are very close to completing their GED at now that they are home to, again, ensure the continuity of that education. And again, that has its own challenges, but we're very grateful to have that opportunity. Just a couple, another set of questions for you. Uh, if you wouldn't mind dropping answers to these in the chat, what were your organization's big successes? What are some things that you learned that can be used moving into whatever your new normal is going to be? And what are some of the sacred cows that can be sacrificed? Things that you've always done just because they've always been done that maybe this pandemic has made you reevaluate. So just take a couple minutes and we can drop those into the chat. And just a reminder, if you are typing your answers to uh, the, the recipients, needs to be all panelists and attendees to make sure everyone can see them. So, Tom, while you guys are doing that, we have a question in the Q&A section. Is there a summary slide or accessible digital content available on the principles and best practices for andragogy mentioned by Mrs. Thomas, um, we, we can certainly help you with that. Um, also, how could one get some examples of the packets um, used by Virginia Correction Education? So they mentioned specifically with Newzella, PBS Learning Resources, that type of thing. I know you mentioned earlier that you would be happy to share a packet information, but um, should we have them contact you directly after you share your contact information at the end of this? Yeah, I think the, the best way to get that information is to just email us, uh, email us directly, and we can we can share that out an example of one of the packets that we've sent out to out to students. And as far as the uh, the summary slide or accessible digital content, I don't know if we have a general summary slide. But again, if you're interested in that information, if you email myself or Miss Thomas, we can uh, put something together for you either in an email or put it together because I'm thinking Ms. Thomas having a summary slide might not be a bad idea for us either. No, it wouldn't be. And I, I was just looking at some of the creative things that are going on out there, um, uh, being able to offer live videos. Uh, I think that's just awesome. I really do. I wish we could do some of the things and, and having te te technology to be able to do so is, is so important and, and beneficial to um, the continuing education of our students. So I'm just looking at some of the things that are coming up in the chat and, and thank you um, for responding to these questions. You know, uh, there's one response here that says definitely need remote access and Ms. Thomas is going to talk about that a little bit at the end, but that is one of the most challenging things we have found. And I think there's another one that says lack of technology is an ongoing issue. Definitely something that we run into. And the one thing I want to emphasize is, yes, lack of technology is an issue and it is an access and equity problem. But educators at whole are, are creative and they are passionate. And we have ultimate faith in the educators in our facilities and within our agency to be able to overcome those obstacles. And it might not be exactly what we want but we have we have faith in our teachers that they are able to overcome overcome those obstacles now that's not going to stop us for advocating for access and equity within 
within our facilities. And like I said, Ms. Thomas will talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, and just the internet not being available in the correctional classrooms, absolutely 100% a challenge, especially when that seems to be the most efficient and equitable way to deliver instruction during a nationwide shutdown. So moving forward, I really appreciate all of your all of your input. And just in the interest of time, we're going to uh, move on. So moving forward, the Department of Corrections is looking to use some of the lessons learned, delivering remote instruction to continue to enhance our distance learning. We all want to school, return to school as normal as soon as possible. But this may not be the only reason that our students are locked down and unable to attend class for an extended period of time. So we're looking at several different options to continue remote instruction and to reach students in new ways. We are looking at using a few remote options. One is Polycom, P-O-L-Y-C-O-M, Polycom, which is a video, voice, and content collaboration. It may allow us to deliver live instruction from remote locations in areas that don't necessarily have access to high-speed internet. There's still a lot, that's still in its infancy, and we're continuing to work through that to see if uh, Polycom is a viable option. We're also looking at delivering remote instruction through closed circuit channels. Our higher security facilities have been doing that. And with the, um, the, uh, I'm the word escape, but with the mental health services unit DVDs that we created, we've been able to see if that's something we would be able to pursue in the future. And we have a group of teachers and administrators out in the Western part of our state that have been have been doing that and we're looking to them to lead us through that. We're also looking at ideas of using uh, software such as Adobe Premiere Power Director coupled with document cameras such as Elmo's to create our own internal instructional video library. This pilot is a little ways off, um, but programs like this will allow the DOC to provide instruction in the event of future lengthy lockdowns. Uh, Ms. Thomas? Okay. So thank you. And we do know that um, as we start to restart and, and shut down again, uh, that we're going to have to be able to bring back students in a safe environment, uh, which means that we cannot bring back all of our students because of the limited capacity. So we're going to be running a, a hybrid model whenever we do reopen. Um, so therefore, we will have to continue to offer those instructional packets. And I've seen a lot about the instructional packets in the chat box. And one of the things that just a little tip that um, you can always contact us, we'll share um, information and resources, but we have a team that comes together and they look at articles and news that is going on currently um, across the world. And we take those articles and news stories and we try to write um, articles that are on each ABE level. So we will write the same content material for our lower levels, our mid-level levels, and our higher levels. And from that, we'll build lessons based upon what the article was. Um, so if we were talking about basketball, um, then we might be talking about um, our preparing instructional materials about perimeters for math um, and so on and so forth. So that's pretty much a gist of how we pretty much do our instructional packets. But it's a team that we have together who kind of build those on. But please, you can always email us and we'll have our contact information um, for you at the end. Um, so while we're continually doing that, we know that the best tool um, that all of us can have in correctional education is technology, the ability to um, be able to plug into the internet for our students to have um, access, to be able to um, continue their learning 24 seven from their pod, um, to be able to contact us for help, um, not through a slow mailing form of instructional packets, but to be able to receive immediate feedback uh, for their lessons, because that really would keep them engaged even more so and motivated when they are able to see what they're accomplishing along the way. So I, I really always push that uh, we all have to be advocates for our students. We all need to be able to raise our voices to our own officials um, inside your institutions, outside of your institution, um, and to speak up for our students about their needs and, and to be able to have safe and secure virtual instructional materials is, is paramount to their growth and development um, and, and their willingness to continue on. The instructional packets are great, 
Um, it is something. And I know a lot of times that everyone says something is, is better than nothing, um, but we can do better for our students um, to, to raise that bar so that they have an equal playing field uh, when able, whenever they are able to release into society, when they, when they go to apply for a job, at least they know um, how to navigate around a computer, which for a lot of our inmates, some of them never have stepped before a computer and, and, and operated um, to do anything but to play solitaire, if that. Um, so that equity and access is, is, is so critical, it's very important. Um, and, and, and I don't push any political agendas, that's not what I'm here for, but advocacy is, is very important. So our contact information is here before you on the screen and we have a couple of minutes left. Um, you can go ahead and we'll leave that up for you to jot that down, but we'd like to hear from you or any more questions that you may have for us. I actually have one thinking back to our prep sessions that we had and um, you guys talked a little bit about when COVID first hit, um, there was a time duration between how long things could be touched before they handed and passed on. So from the time the student completes the instructional packet to getting back to the teacher and then the teacher being able to provide some sort of response. Um, how have you guys sort of addressed that challenge and what are you doing sort of preemptively to help, I don't know, get resources to students as quickly as possible? Yes, yeah, so exactly, that is a challenge and it still is a challenge today. Um, as, as an institution starts to see cases amongst this inmate population, things kind of come to a halt in the mind of keeping safety of everyone um, is that concern. So generally when a packet is mailed from a teacher, a lot of times it goes to the mail room, it kind of sits in a mail room in a quarantine box for about three days as that is what the CDC had first um, suggested in regards to mail. So then it sits there for three days and then it would go to the students and then that same process would happen, but we have to wait for that delivery. So we saw in some cases it was two to three weeks for that turnaround. It has gotten a little bit better um, when institutions realize that it is safe, there's not too many cases, or it's just going from one building. Um, we kind of have a quicker turnaround, but it, it is, in a lot of cases, do take about a week. And, and that's what I talk about that access, that equity and access, because that immediate feedback is <laughs> really paused, or it takes a long time for a student to really realize if they're doing well, or it takes us a longer time to realize if they need additional support or, or help along the way. Absolutely. Do we have any other questions from, from the crowd? Anything? We have a, about two minutes left here. I'm sure Shaketa and Tom have a plethora of uh, resources and things that they'd be willing to share. Yes, we do. And again, please, uh, this was a brief overview of, of what it is that we have been doing. And we probably didn't dive in depth into much of it. And we'll be doing some um, presentations um, later on in the spring, more so where we get a little bit more plugged in. But please do contact us. Um, we, we are a small body correctional education. Uh, I can't speak. Correctional educators across the nation. Um, and, and the more we connect and collaborate, the better we position ourselves to serve our students. So um, we are here um, for you. And this is our contact information here before your screen. So go ahead and jot it down. You can send us an email uh, anytime and we will respond. Thank that you. Was a, that was a wonderful way to end it because like I said in the beginning, there's power in working together. And I am really, really grateful. Although this is the Maryland Virtual Training Institute, we are really grateful to have you as our peers and willing to share with our instructors as well as you know uh, teachers throughout the state. So thank you guys again for uh, your willingness to share with us today. Before you leave, if everyone can take a moment, I just put a um, link in the chat box for a feedback form. Um, what I've been saying all week is, we can't grow if we don't know. So if you found this presentation very helpful, we'd love to be able to you know, find additional information to support these types of sessions at future virtual training institutes. Or if the opposite, you know, uh, I value feedback, even, even challenging feedback, but 
Um, this was incredibly informative and wonderful. So thank you both for your time, as well as um, the wonderful interactivity from all of our participants in the chat box today. Um, but as they both mentioned, if you have outstanding questions are very, you know, um, spe specialized questions, please feel free to reach out to one of us directly. Um, oh, we have one more, we have one more, we have time for one more question in, in the chat box if you guys want to take this one. Yeah, uh, so the, the question is, for those of you still here, uh, we're looking to the advanced student-led instructive assisted model more for perhaps providing more targeted on-site instruction be something for future consideration as well. Has Virginia Correctional Ed had any thoughts, examples along these lines? Um, well, I don't know anything specifically about that, Chiquetta, you may, but I do know that as we return to the new normal, all options are on the table, whatever that looks like. And I know we do have tutors within our classrooms that are other inmates that are in the classrooms tutoring, but it's not necessarily student-led instruction. Um, I'm not 100% aware of that specific model you've referenced, so that might be something I have to look into a little further. But like I said, all options are on the table as long as we can do it safely and ensure the continuity of instruction um, within, within the correctional facility. Um, Ms. Thomas, you have anything to add to that? No, I, think, I don't. Thanks everyone for attending this session. I, I do hope you were able to walk away with a little bit of something to add to your toolbox. Thanks again. Yes. Awesome. Thank you guys so much and have a wonderful holiday season. Bye-bye. Okay. Uh, Mr. Trying to thank you, Mr. Cray, and I appreciate that, your, your support there.